Today's video is going to be about chapter 11 on Campbell biology, which is about cell communications. So let's begin. Hi guys, my name is Mikey from Able Prop Academy, and today we're going to be having a little bit more of a formal lecture on chapter 11 on cell communications out of the Campbell Biology textbook. So this video will be slightly longer than other videos, but if you're having trouble with this chapter, which is a pretty difficult one, hopefully we can clarify some of these concepts in this video and beyond. Now, in unit four, we do talk about cell cycle as well, which does seem like it's pretty disconnected from the cell communication chapter, but there is going to be some overlap and hopefully we can identify those and talk about those in subsequent videos as well. And before we get started with today's video officially, I just want to thank you guys for tuning in. This whole YouTube thing has been relatively experimental, but we've been getting some amazing feedback from you guys, not only in high school, but also colleges as well for the University of Alaska. So that's really awesome to hear. So thank you guys. And if you guys are new to this channel, then consider subscribing because we're planning on many more videos to come in the near future. So let's begin with chapter 11 properly. Chapter 11 has five parts, 11.1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now 11.1 is going to talk about the generalities of communication systems within cells. Chapters 11.2, 3, and 4 are going to focus on the three main steps involved in the communication pathways. And 11.5 is going to deal with apoptosis or programmed cell death, which does loosely connect to the ideas that are presented in the previous sections of this chapter. So beginning with 11.1, the background, here's what you need to know. Firstly, we communicate as human beings using our voice, which is how you're able to hear me right now. But the way that this works is by pushing air through our lungs, in through our vocal cords, traveling through the air, and then getting into your ears. But you see, when we talk about cell communication systems, it's gonna work a little bit differently because just the fact that we're able to do vocal communications is the combination of many, many, many cells working together. So at the level of the cell, the way that we're gonna be communicating is by chemical signal. Instead of voices, we're gonna be using chemicals. And as such, we need to talk about what these chemical signals are and how they're received by adjacent or at distant cells. So the way that we're gonna be doing this is by looking at a model organism called Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which are a yeast species in their communication pathways. So here's the thing about Saccharomyces. Instead of males and females, these sexually reproducing Saccharomyces cerevisiae have mating types called the alpha and the A types, and they have to find each other in the wild in order to... For what? You know in order to reproduce sexually. So the A cells and the alpha cells are gonna have to call out to each other. But once again, because we're focusing on chemicals, let's see how this works. The A cell produces a chemical called the A factor, while the alpha cell produces a chemical called the alpha factor. Now these can be considered to be the voices of these cells, but as they are released from their cells into their surroundings, the diffusion of such chemicals can reach the cell of the other mating type. However, in order for them to listen into the opposite, here's what the A cell has. The A cell have something called the alpha factor receptor, which are only able to listen in on the alpha factors, while the alpha cells have a receptor called the A factor receptor, which are only able to listen in to the A factors. And as such, they can only hear each other in terms of the chemical signaling. And as the concentrations are detected by respective cells, they can orient themselves towards where there is greater A or alpha factor, depending on your cell type. And eventually they will migrate or taxi over to where the opposite cells are, allowing them to actually mate and reproduce sexually. So this chemical signaling is going to involve the actual chemicals as well as receptors. And that is gonna be the theme carried out through the rest of the chapter. The fact that we have signaling molecules that we typically refer to as ligands, and then of course the receptors, which are the ligand receptors. So that is how we've introduced this entire idea. However, there's one thing that I want you guys to keep in mind as you read through 11.1, and that is that even though we're looking at such a simple organism like a yeast, we have to understand that much of the cell communication systems that are introduced here are conserved throughout the remainder of the biological realm, which means that even complex organisms like ourselves with multi-cell systems still utilize very similar mechanisms in order to communicate within our bodies, which means that one cell can talk to another cell within our body using the very similar systems that we see happening in systems like that of the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So let's talk about 11. Point two, three, and four. And in order to introduce these three sections, I wanna tell you a story about a scientist by the name of Earl W. Sutherland. Because Earl W. Sutherland was one of the pioneers in elucidating exactly how cell communication systems worked. Now, he was interested in the effects of 
epinephrine on liver cells. So let me give you a little bit of background on that. Epinephrine is often referred to as the fight or flight response hormone, and it's also known as adrenaline. So if you've ever played sports or you had to give a speech in front of many people, that feeling of anxiety, as well as your heart pumping and just everything that's happening in your body is typically induced by the presence of epinephrine in your bloodstream. But what's interesting is that epinephrine has differential effects on different parts of your body. As I just mentioned, epinephrine can make your heart beat faster, but when it hits your liver cells, it actually tells the liver cells to turn some of that glycogen back into the glucose monomers so that we can fill the bloodstream with sugar so that we can metabolize it and have sufficient energy to either fight or flight as the category of the hormone suggests. So what we need to understand here is that the ultimate effect of epinephrine arriving at a liver cell should be the production of glucose from our glycogen. Now, when Earl W. Sutherland studied the effects of epinephrine on liver cells, what he realized was that there were three main stages that occurred as epinephrine ultimately resulted in the synthesis of glucose. So here are those three steps. One, reception, two, transduction, and three, response. And as we move on through this chapter, 11.2, 3, and 4 are going to each dive into each one of the steps of the communication pathways a little bit more deeply. So what we're going to be doing here is looking at that reception first by diving into 11.2. So chapter 11.2 is about reception. And this is something that I've already mentioned in the video where I said that there is a ligand or the signaling molecule which must be received by a receptor. The receptors are what we're gonna be paying the most attention to. Because one of the first things I wanna mention here is that given that the ligand is a water-soluble ligand, as in it's traveling through either the bloodstream or in the open water, the receptor must be a transmembrane protein or a membrane-bound receptor. And the reason is that things that are diffusible in water are not likely to cross that phospholipid bilayer, indicating that the door knock has to open on the outside of the cell. As such, the receptors are going to have a ligand binding site facing the outer portion of the membrane. And when it comes to receptors, we have three major types that we need to be paying attention to. The first type is called the GPCR or G protein couple receptor. Second type is called the RTK or receptor tyrosine kinases. And the last kind is gonna be called the ligand gated ion channels. Let's focus on the first one first because I think that's the most important one. GPCRs or G protein coupled receptors are the largest category of membrane bound ligand receptors that we have in biology. And here's how this generally works. Remember that these receptors are made from proteins and you've probably already learned about enzymes and their active site. And you can kind of see a corollary here. Instead of having an enzyme with an active site, we're going to have a protein that is bound to the membrane with what we call a ligand binding site instead facing the outside. And that is where the signal can bind to. And when a signal binds to the ligand binding site, then there usually is a conformational change or a change in the protein structure on account of the new chemical interactions at the ligand binding site, which then ultimately triggers a change in the protein shape within the inner part of the cell membrane. And G protein couple receptors are no exception. With G protein couple receptors, when you have a ligand binding to the ligand binding site, the inner portion of the protein changes the shape such that it interfaces with the G protein, removing the guanosine diphosphate that is attached to the inactive form of that G protein. Now, when the GDP is released, then the G protein has now the opportunity to bind to a GTP or an energy molecule, which then activates that G protein into action. Now, usually G protein acts more like a messenger, meaning that it relays the fact that there was a ligand binding to the receptor and using that GTP, it's able to migrate or move along the inner portion of the phospholipid bilayer activating a subsequent enzyme or another substrate downstream in the sequence of events. Now, in accordance to the textbook, this is sort of where we stop. When we talk about transduction, we're gonna revisit that G-protein couple receptors, but for now, just know that that's how GPCRs generally initiate the signal from the outside to something that's on the inside. Now, receptor tyrosine kinases are slightly different. They usually come as two parts of a dimer or monomers that both have ligand binding sites. Now, when these two ligand binding sites on respective RTKs are activated, then again, the chemical change results in a conformation change within the actual receptor tyrosine kinases, which then helps them to dimerize. Now, when the two components dimerize and come together, it allows the tyrosine residues on the inside of the membranes to become phosphorylated by ATP, which can then pass on that information to subsequent enzymes that can become activated. 
Now, before we move on any further, I need to clarify something here because I just mentioned the word kinase, and that's going to be a really important word as we go through today's lecture. The word kinase refers to a class of proteins or enzymes that has the capacity to take an ATP, remove its phosphate, and put it on something else. And the reason that this is important is that the presence of phosphate on a substrate or on a target protein is typically associated with the activation of that protein. I like to think about phosphates acting like a battery such that if I were to put a battery into a machine, then I can therefore turn it on. And the kinase is acting as the person that places a battery into the machine. So receptor tyrosine kinases, by taking that phosphate from ATP and putting it into the subsequent enzymes are therefore able to activate downstream mechanisms that could perhaps lead to a response later on. Now, the last one is called the ligand-gated ion channels. Now, this one is not as interesting to us anymore because of the fact that we've gotten rid of physiology from AP Biology curriculum. However, if you're taking a different course where this can be important, please recall that there are more informations available out there for ligand-gated ion channels. But I will explain it in a nutshell. So ligand-gated ion channels are receptors that double as channels. Now, remember from Unit 2 that channels are simply facilitated diffusion proteins that allow for substances to move from high to low concentration depending on where they are situated with respect to the cell membrane. So when a ligand binds to a ligand-gated ion channel, it can open up that channel allowing the flow of ions, whether it be sodium or calcium, depending on the system that you're looking at. But for the time being, that's really all you need to know because the emphasis from this point onwards is going to be on G protein couple receptors that we talked about at the beginning of this unit. Now 11.2 is about transduction and this is where students have the most amount of trouble. Transduction is the idea that once a signal arrives at the receptor, whether it be GPCR or anything else, we're able to amplify that message within the cell cytoplasm. However, the way that Campbell Biology does this can be a little bit confusing. So what I'm going to do is actually introduce the idea of second messengers first, and then we'll talk about the phosphorylation cascade. So what are second messengers? Well, second messengers are relay molecules that exist between the receptor and the phosphorylation cascade that amplifies the message. So in order to understand this, let's just take a look at one example of a second messenger, which is cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP starts its life as an adenosine triphosphate or ATP, but through the action of an enzyme called adenyl cyclase, it's able to lose two of its phosphates and cyclically attach that phosphate back to the ribose sugar, becoming cyclic AMP. Now it turns out that cyclic AMP has this capacity to be an activator for many proteins downstream in the phosphorylation cascade. However, let's first take a look at how this all ties in to a G protein couple receptor. Because earlier I said that G protein couple receptors receive a ligand and activates a G protein. Now the G protein then acts as a messenger that carries the message of a ligand binding along the plasma membrane. But one of the enzymes that a G protein couple receptor can activate is the enzyme adenylcyclase. Now remember, adenylcyclase is a membrane-bound protein that has the enzymatic capacity to turn ATP into cyclic AMP. And as you can see, now what we're looking at is the ability of the ligand that landed outside of the cell to then be transformed into a real chemical message in the form of cyclic AMP. Now there are many cyclic AMP molecules that are actually produced when adenylcyclase is activated, and each of these cyclic AMP molecules can then therefore trigger the phosphorylation cascade. So what is the phosphorylation cascade? Well, in this image, what you're looking at is something called a relay molecule. But remember, because we talked about cyclic AMP first, this relay molecule is actually cyclic AMP. And you can see that it has the capacity to activate a protein kinase. Now, when that protein kinase is activated via attachment to cyclic AMP, it then gains the ability to act as a kinase, allowing it to take ATP, remove its phosphate, and put that on the subsequent kinase here, which is protein kinase 2, which then does the same thing, taking the ATP, removing the phosphate, and putting it onto protein kinase 3, and so on. Now, because each of these kinases are able to attach further phosphates onto the subsequent downstream molecules, we call this a phosphorylation cascade. But here is where most students get really confused, because what is the point of all of this? Because you can easily take that cyclic AMP and use that to activate the final enzyme that we might want to activate. So what's the point of having all of these messengers that are doing this relay? Now, one of the ways I like to think about this is like a relay race where one runner can activate another runner. However, there is a little bit more nuance to this because the idea here is that each kinase has the capacity to activate 
10 kinases that's downstream in the signal transduction pathway. And then each of those 10 kinases can then activate a further 10. And at each point where the baton is passed on, it's not that one runner is passing on one baton to the next runner, it's that one runner is carrying 10 batons and activating 10 runners, each of whom are carrying 10 batons. And as you can see, the single message that we received as a single molecule ligand can quickly become amplified to a great degree. In fact, what this table shows is that one epinephrine molecule binding to an epinephrine receptor on a liver cell can result in 10 to the power of eight molecules or 100 million molecules of glucose eventually becoming freed from glycogen. So this amplification is the name of the game when it comes to the phosphorylation cascade. But there's also one more function. By having many steps along the sequence of events, what this allows is multiple modes of modulation. And what that means is that there are many other molecules that could be competing against the kinases, such as phosphatases, which are trying to inactivate the kinases. And by having multiple places where you can moderate or you can regulate this process, you can really fine tune the response depending on exactly what you need, as well as having multiple ligands that can antagonistically work against each other to precisely fine tune the response that you need. Now 11.4 is going to be about that response, but here there's not a lot to think about. It's just that the very last kinase that we activate is going to activate the effector protein. So in the case of epinephrine and its action on glycogen, the last enzyme that becomes activated would be glycogen phosphorylase, which has the capacity to break glycogen back down into glucose. Now there are other responses that we do dive into in this chapter, such as activation of gene expression from things such as hormones, but those are details that you can definitely read about in the textbook, and I won't go into them in detail today. Now, 11.5 is about apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. Now, to give you guys a general background of why this is important, remember that in many stages of embryonic development, we actually overproduce cells, such as the stumps of our hands, which are then fine-tuned into the digits that we see. And the removal of those cells through programmed cell death is going to involve apoptosis. Now, one of the model organisms that we use to study apoptosis is C. elegans, which is a very small nematode. And in C. elegans, here's what we've discovered. As this picture shows, we have a receptor for the death signaling molecule. Now, the death signaling molecule would be that ligand, in very much the same processes that we've been talking about thus far. And here we're looking at CD9, which is on the mitochondria as being active, which is actively inhibiting CD4 and CD3. Now, when the death signaling molecule arrives, it has the capacity to go through that signal transduction pathway that we've discussed before, and deactivate CD9. Now, when you deactivate CD9, now there's nothing holding CD9 back from inhibiting CD4 and CD3, which then in turn become activated. Now, when CD4 and 3 become activated, it can then subsequently activate nucleases, proteases, and all of the other enzymes that can lead to the activation of programmed cell death. The reason that this is included here is that the book really wants you to know a little bit about the importance of the role that apoptosis plays in embryonic development as well as understand that the things that trigger such big events within the cell are directly tied to signal transduction pathways that are fairly complicated happening within our cytoplasm. Now guys, there's a lot more to this chapter and I certainly can't get into all the nitty gritty details, but I will probably make some shorter videos on very specific topics that are found within this chapter, such as how the alpha and the A cells find each other based on concentration gradients. But for today's video, I just want to give you guys the very basic background so that you can have something to watch as you read along with your textbook. So please stay tuned for more descriptive videos in the coming future. Otherwise, this has been Mikey with Able Prep Academy. It's great having you guys here. Uh, if you haven't done so, please subscribe to this channel and like the video so you can tell us what kind of contents you guys enjoy. And we'll see you in the next video. Have a great day.